The countdown is on. Everything you need to get the edge at the end of the market day. This is The Close. The economic angst subsides and the market rally resumes. From Studio 2 here at Bloomberg headquarters in New York, I'm Romaine Bostic. And I'm Alex Steele. I cannot keep straight. Downtrend or uptrend? I, uptrend today. Well, wait till tomorrow because it might be the exact opposite That's of what we have today. what I'm saying. All right, let's take a look at the S&P. We're up over 2%. We're, we've moved the most uh, since January of 2023 on the S&P. So it's a significant move to the upside. Uh, the NASDAQ also uh, following suit here, the highest level since earlier in 2024. And the 10-year yield is up by five basis points. That's what kind of you need to know. You have stocks up, you have yields up, everything feels okay, Romain. Yeah, but how does it feel in the economy? Because it really was the delicate state of the labor market that had really been the driver of the price action for the last few sessions, and today really is no exception. Jobless claims out this morning, and those initial applications for U.S. unemployment benefits falling the most in nearly a year, and that did alleviate some concern that jobs growth had been cooling too fast. Today's stock market gains close to erasing all of the losses from earlier this week. Stay tuned as we count down to the close. Treasuries, though, moving in the opposite direction, holding losses for a third day following that jobs data at 8.30 a.m., a sell-off that accelerated at 1 p.m. after demand for the Treasury sale of 30-year bonds proved a bit paltry. Benchmark 10-year yields now back above 4% in a continuation of these wild swings in yields this week as investors really try to get a better hold of economic conditions. Now, we did get a few more glimpses into those conditions over the past 24 hours with some relatively disappointing earnings from energy drink maker Monster Beverage, from the food service distributor U.S. Foods, and from Burger King operator Restaurant Brands. Earnings there weren't awful, but they did continue to reflect malaise among would-be diners. We do see some pressure on, on, the consumers, uh, on consumers' overall financials. There are some things that are going up in their budget, things like rents, uh, or insurance payments are putting some pressure and that's causing consumers to be more choiceful. And I was the CEO of Restaurants Brands, Alex, and we've kind of heard this from a lot of executives on this program here. They're still making money, but their customers aren't spending the way they used to. Yeah, so if your top line goes off, what are your levers then to help your margin? That's yeah. also a question uh, that I have in the quick service restaurants. So here is the story that Romain was just talking about, and it's illustrated so you can really see uh, that those jobless claims. It's the S&P uh, mini futures. That is the white line, and then the blue line is the, just the straight-up generic two-year yield. This is when you got jobless claims. I don't think I've ever seen a move like this in equities or in the bond market on jobless claims, no less, or at least that's what it's being attributed to one o'clock you get the 30-year auction didn't go anywhere it was kind of eh for most investors but yet we still uh grind higher it was interesting um pimco actually coming out and saying it could be a bumpy bumpy row but they're starting to add to those treasury positions again with that defensive kind of mindset so it doesn't feel romaine that the angst is truly over yet Absolutely. Here, let's keep it going here as we count down to the closing bells. Bryce Doty joining us right now, Senior Vice President and Portfolio Manager at SIT Investment Associates. And Bryce, I'm going to pick up on something that Alex just kind of hit on here. I have no idea the last time you saw this type of a market move off of a weekly jobless claims number. And I'm not just talking about in the equity space, but you even see that reflected in fixed income as well. Were you up trading this this morning? Well, you know, you make a good point. It is significant to know when there's a, a hypersensitive market move to a really mundane number. It tells you that things are really um, precarious. Otherwise, uh, I would never have done anything like that. <clears throat> what we have done to take advantage of this change in volatility is, is just use some derivatives. So we have a certain group of portfolios or strategies that uh, where we hedge the duration. Mm -hmm. We use that with uh, treasury futures or options on futures. And the options, uh, flipping between the two is really beneficial when vol changes. So when things are calm, like today's a calm day, mm -hmm. you add some options knowing that, just as you mentioned earlier, yeah. just wait an hour, wait a day. And there'll be another surprise in an overreaction to another mundane number like claims. I, and then I, after, after that, after that VIX or that vol spikes, then we then we just flip right back into the futures. How confident are you? I mean, just based on everything that's transpired over, the, let's just say over the last couple of weeks, uh, coming out of those earnings last week, the jobs report on Friday and everything that's transpired this week. Did that give you any confidence in extending duration or did it have the opposite effect? The main thing that the last two weeks worth of data has done for us is convince us that the curve is going to normalize. Hmm. 
So we think that the Fed is is going to steadily uh, move towards uh, towards lower rates. Don't know exactly how far, what the magnitude is going to be, but we just need to know the direction. And what that's going to do is it's going to mean that you want to be positioned in the middle of the yield curve. The three to six year will be the best part. The 30 year is going to be pretty precarious. Uh, it's it's not done well over the last year. Yields are actually up on the 30 year where everything else is the same or lower. Mm -hmm. So that's what's really convinced us uh, is a sustainable trend, a sustainable normalization of the curve in the last two weeks. So what is that then, Bryce? mean for the uh, bond for the corporate credit market right like it doesn't feel like the corporate credit market has responded in the same way that the treasury market has or even the vix has to whatever kind of volatility spike and growth scare that we're looking at yes for sure the corporate bond market has yield buyers you know it, there's a whole generation of a bond investor who have forgotten what that even means when yields get to a certain height or point people are like hey for that company, for that triple B rated company, I need 6% yield to compensate me for that 10 year default risk. Treasury yields could be four, they could be five, they can be whatever. And the yield buyer will be, nah, I still need 6%. You know, so treasury yields might fall and corporate bonds won't keep up because if anything, the decline in treasury yields is happening because of a fear of worsening economic conditions. Mm -hmm. That's not good for default rates. So what we're doing in the belly of the curve is we're lightening up on corporates because they're going to underperform. They won't keep up. And uh, we're going to more of government agency mortgage type securities, specifically ones that will do really well if mortgage rates come down and prepayments pick up. Mm -hmm. We think that those are going to add a lot more um, return as well as protect you from downside against default risk. So does that set up imply that we're going to be headed toward a recession or increasing recession odds or just decreasing uh, the Goldilocks soft landing scenario? What, what makes the difference for us in terms of whether it's going to be a recession or not is credit and credit availability. Credit Banks were tightening credit like mad a year ago, March, when, when banks were uh, failing. Yields coming down has bought them time, given them breathing room. Their loans are not so underwater now. So from a capital constrained perspective, it's, it's not as bad. Ironically, as the consumer struggles, and they are, banks will actually be easing up on uh, credit. They'll be allowing more credit. Uh, I don't think I've ever seen that happen in a, in a down cycle before. But it might be just enough to keep us from going into a full-blown recession because it's a credit crunch that really puts an economy over the edge. Yeah. And we don't see that happening this time. Hey, Bryce, great perspective. Really appreciate that. Bryce Doty, uh, Senior Vice President and Portfolio Manager over at SIT Investment Associates. Breaking news for you here, Romain, concerning Delta. So they're saying that the third quarter direct revenue impact from their outage uh, a few weeks ago related to CrowdStrike and Microsoft will cost them about $380 million. And they are pursuing legal claims against CrowdStrike and Microsoft. Yeah, interesting, too, to look at some of their projections going forward and maybe a potential effect when we get to that next earnings report, whether they can recoup some of that money, uh, I guess, remains to be I seen. Know. All right, a lot more coming up here on the show, including a full closer look at those weight loss drugs, the race for GLP-1 dominance. Well, Novo holds the crown, but Eli Lilly narrowing the gap. We're going to talk about Eli Lilly's latest results here and their efforts to increase production. Plus, you got shares of Under Armour soaring today. It continues to push towards that turnaround. It is our stock of the hour. And a big bonus bump. Potentially, a new report expecting Wall Street bonuses to jump as much as 35% this year. That would be a welcome reprieve given the last couple of years. All that and more coming up in just a bit. This is the close on Bloomberg. is here. You're seeing back-to-back billion-dollar-plus quarters. The forward indicators were so positive. Bloomberg is first to break the numbers. Texas Instruments out, folks. Goldman Sachs. Taking a look at Mattel. There is something for everybody. With the smartest insights. People are whitewashing AI. Wallets are under pressure. We are committed to EVs. They're going to happen. Earnings season in full swing. We will have full and instant analysis. Continuing coverage on Bloomberg. Context changes everything.
Markets breathing their sigh of relief today. S&P around the highs of the session. That trigger was U.S. initial jobless claims declining by most in nearly a year, alleviating some of those concerns the labor market's cooling too much too fast. Today's data is better. The Fed, though, still has to avert a downturn, and a large part of that depends on how long corporate America continues the phenomenon of labor hoarding. Joining us now from Morris Bloomberg's Amara Amokwe, uh, she has more on this. Amara, how do we know that companies are actually hoarding labor right now? Well, because what we've seen as the Fed hiked interest rates to the highest level in over two decades is that employers have responded by pulling back on openings, uh, slowing the pace of hiring, um, cutting back on workers' hours, but they're still holding on to their workers. We haven't seen a spike in layoffs, which is kind of counterintuitive to what you would think you would see as the economy slows and as things cool down. So that's a sign to us that employers are wanting to hold on to those workers that they worked really hard to get earlier in the pandemic recovery. As we came out of the pandemic, we had a lot of labor shortages and employers really had to work hard to get those workers. So it appears that they're really wanting to hold on to them now. Are we seeing any evidence, though, of a significant slowdown in wage growth for those workers that are already on the books? So we have seen wage wage growth slow um, compared with earlier in the pandemic recovery. And that's just another sign of how employers are managing an economy that is still solid, but that has cooled off. And I think the question, one of the big questions for the Fed as it looks to keep the labor market strong is how long are we going to stay in this environment where there has where that has where there has been low firings and also low hirings? Right. And it feels like when the top line starts to slow, as the economy kind of slows, how much cost cuts have these companies already struck out or taken out? So then is labor like that last lever to pull? Exactly. And that's one of the questions that I hear economists talking about now, right? Layoffs are still low. If you look at the trend, they're still kind of in line with where they were pre-pandemic. But if employers keep on feeling like things are slowing, if we see consumer spending continue to slow, then the question becomes, do they feel compelled to kind of use a different strategy than what they've used so far and start upping the pace of job cuts? When, it, when we talk about this idea of kind of whether the labor market is, you know, is whether it's soft or whether it's hot and, and how that feeds into the reaction function by the Fed and really for our purposes here, Amari, the, obviously the reaction function by the markets, does it matter that some of this softness isn't actually going to be reflected in the official data? I think so. You know, I actually asked uh, Chair Powell about this at the last press conference and I said, look, are you considering the soft data Additionally, in addition to sort of some sort of the hard data on the unemployment rate, on wage and on wages and those sorts of things. And he said, yes, we actually do look at the beige book. We do listen to what the regional Fed presidents are saying about what they're hearing in their districts. And there are signs in the anecdotal data that that things are slowing and that things aren't necessarily as good as the top line data would suggest. So I think Fed officials definitely do take that into account when they're considering uh, how they should be setting policy in the months going forward. All right, Amari, uh, always uh, great to talk to you. Amari Amokwe uh, there uh, over at uh, Bloomberg News, a closer look here at the labor market. We've been talking a lot, uh, Alex, of course, about the softness in job creation. I am a little curious about wages specifically here because we've seen this phenomenal wage growth for people at the lower end of the spectrum. But apparently if you're at the higher end of the spectrum, you're going to see some wage growth this year as as well, a story on the Bloomberg terminal saying that Wall Street, you should expect some pretty significant bonuses this year after two years where well, they kind of got a little shafted. Uh, 35 percent is kind of what they're tracking right now, though most of that looks like it's going to go or the bigger percentage of that's going to go to those folks in debt underwriting. If you're in retail banking, you're probably not going to get much anything. Yeah, that retail yeah. banking doesn't look so good. But yeah. there's a great chart in this, which you guys should check out. It's debt underwriting at the high end could be as much as 35 percent. But to Remain's point, retail commercial banking, negative 5 percent uh, to flat and kind of right. Equity underwriting, though, still good. 20 to 30 percent there. Equity sales, 10 to 15 percent. Not bad, not bad. Yeah, uh, wealth management, not to undo bad and hedge funds here. But it's kind of interesting, too, because we talk, I mean, obviously, we know a lot of these folks, a huge chunk of their total comp compensation comes from these bonuses here. So to have two down years like that, I'm sure it had to hurt a lot of folks. So this will be welcome news. And we always do the parlor game here, of course, being in New York. These bonuses have a real economic impact uh, here in the, uh, at least here in New York, where people do spend a lot of money. They go out and, I don't know, buy Ferraris or third homes or whatever. Aren't you shopping for a Ferrari? Didn't you mention that no, yesterday? No, you're the one that wants the Ferrari. <laughs> I do. He's the one who's looking for 
for that one. Uh, uh, parking on the streets in New York, that kind of thing? Oh, yeah, that's perfect. Yeah, what better place to park a Ferrari than on the streets of New York? All right, <laughs> when we come back, we're going to talk about Disney, the streaming service. Actually, maybe thriving, but some analysts are telling investors that focus on the theme parks. That's where the weakness is. We're going to talk to one of the analysts behind one of the big calls of the day. That's coming up next on The Close on Bloomberg. All right, let's get a view from the sell side with our top calls, the big movers on the back of analyst recommendations. And we start off today with the energy drink maker Celsius getting its only sell equivalent rating. This over at Bank of America moved to underperform with the analysts saying the energy drink category, quote, ain't what it used to be. The pace of volume growth in the sector has started to erode with no signs of near term recovery. The price target also being cut just by about half. Nevertheless, the shares are bucking that higher by about six tenths of a percent. Next up, let's stick with Bank of America because they have another interesting call out today, this time on Top Golf, a downgrade to neutral with the analysts expecting same venue sales to slow this year. And he sees a difficult outlook for corporate events as well as businesses continue to cut some of that event spending. The price target there swinging down to 13 from 18. The shares down by about 3% on the day. And let's take a look at Intel losing another buy rating, this time at Mizuho, which cuts to neutral. The analysts, remember, had upgraded the chip maker back in November on hopes for new AI and data center products. Today, he's telling investors we were wrong. He says Intel continues to lag its peers and continues to lose share in all of its key markets. The shares, though, gaining on the day up by about six and a half percent. And those are some of our top calls. Let's now turn to one of the most talked about companies of the week, and that is Disney, a downgrade to neutral from buy over at Research Partners. The analyst says slower consumer trends for the happiest place on Earth may have investors <laughs> feeling blue. I like that. David Joyce joining us right now, senior analyst covering media over at Seaport Research Partners, analyst behind that call, we should say. And David, uh, this was an interesting earnings report because, of course, everyone was so hyper-focused on what was going on with the streaming and entertainment business. I think what happened at the parks business caught a lot of folks by surprise. Is this just kind of a one-off uh, for the parks business, or should we expect uh, more trouble over the next couple of quarters? I think uh, we're probably going to be in a holding pattern for the next few quarters on the parks. Um, we've you know, we really had uh, a, f a few items uh, hit the shares of Disney you know, since they peaked around their uh, uh, annual uh, shareholder meeting. You had the activist in there, and then they dumped their shares. And then you had the former founder of Marvel dumping you know their shares, and that that hit the stock. Then you had Comcast. Uh, uh, about uh, a week and a half, two weeks ago, talking about their theme parks, starting to see some uh, issue from uh, the pent up demand post COVID to go to parks, uh, starting to evaporate. So it's getting into a more normalized period. Uh, you know, I think people were still holding out a little bit of hope that uh, you know, Disney was a u unique set of uh, assets, and yeah. it is, uh, but you do have uh, other commentary coming out of the company uh, that's suggesting that the lower end consumer uh, uh, is uh, tightening their belt. Uh, and Disney has really taken a lot of price over the past few years with all of this demand. And then you also have the higher end consumer uh, taking advantage of the strong uh, U.S. dollar and traveling overseas instead of going to the parks. So there's kind of a, a two part factor on the parks. Right. So, David, uh, that, does that mean, though, it, if I can jump in, does that mean, David, that we've hit a price wall here? And does Disney recognize that? And will they change that then when it comes to their parks? They always have a lot of uh, levers at their disposal uh, in terms of various types of promotions to get you to come and you know, stay for three days and pay for two or what have you. Uh, so they'll try to maintain price, but but, but have some other uh, offerings. Uh, but we just think that the um, uh, with with the cost inflation for labor and the rest of the infrastructure, uh, it, combined with you know, flattish uh, uh, U.S. attendance. Uh, we've, uh, and with uh, attendance in China likely down uh, in the short term, we've got attendance in Paris down because of the Olympics They're taking away some of that. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think you, it's a, it's a it's a couple quarters of of of, uh, of of negative operating income growth. I want to kind of push this forward a little bit, Dave, and talk a little bit more about what's going on in the streaming space. For Disney, the streaming numbers were still pretty good. We got Warner Brothers uh, yesterday as well. Their numbers weren't awful, although they've got a lot of other issues they have to sort out. We're going to get Paramount tonight. And that, of course, is just a completely different story, given uh, the pending acquisition here. But what actually do you make of the current 
streaming strategy they have? And do you think we're going to see meaningful changes to that strategy once this acquisition is done? Well, you know, at, at Disney, just to complete the thought on, on the downgrade, you know, they got to profitability a quarter earlier than expected. And I think a lot of uh, the investors and analysts were expecting maybe a billion of profitability for, you know, for Disney next year. But now uh, they realize that they need to invest more in the user interface and uh, in the technology and the ad tech platform. So you're not going to get that uh, acceleration that uh, hoped for a you know, billion dollars of profit on uh, streaming uh, you know, yeah. for, for Disney probably still do six or seven hundred million um but as it pertains to uh you know to paramount it is a they do have a lot of content it, they do have sports content which helps things uh you know, but they do have a smaller platform they don't have the global platform that disney has in place or that netflix has in place uh and uh really that, that stock is just you know, driven by the head scratching uh, corporate actions uh that, that have gone on with the you know with the yeah the control shareholder there hey david real quick Will the quarter have any influence on the Skydance deal? I don't think so. You, you, you have the go shop period just about done, I think, for uh, for the Skydance deal. Um, you know, there's still a vast disparity between the non-voting shares and, and the voting shares. Uh, and I think you've seen some other potential bidders probably is, is step out of the process. Uh, but I think it's still going to take a little while before the fundamental story and opportunity set for Paramount shows through. But I don't think this quarter changes anything. All right, David, thanks a lot. Really appreciate it. David Joyce over at Seaport Research uh, joining us now. And Romain brought up Warner Brothers. That stock down by about 9%. Uh, it was pretty grim. Like the streaming area did really well, but that $9 billion plus charge of its traditional TV networks. How do you come back from that? Like, how do you manage that? This, this is a phenomenal. I mean, I'm sure there's going to be a gazillion Harvard case studies about this. You know, I mean, oh, let's, yeah. I mean, the nine, the write down, though, I mean, that, I mean, that's the own goal, right? I mean, they made this acquisition. What was it like two, three years ago here? Everyone said it was a bad idea to saddle up with that much debt. And it came back to bite them. I mean, over the past, yeah. right, because I was looking at the, at the 2001. I remember this one time Warner uh, merged. Right. And you have America online. Remember that whole thing that happened? <laughs> do I remember? Uh, yes. Yeah. And then later. That was spectacular. The a spectacular of, disaster. Exactly. Yeah. And Time Warner by AT&T for $87 billion in 2018. It's like becomes a really big head scratcher of how it, how it got here. And that was bananas too, the AT&T. It's like they've been looking for something for all these years and they've never quite been able to find it. And now here we are kind of back at square one. Yeah, but at well, issue though is that if, even if streaming is doing well, the traditional TV that makes the money doesn't. How do you square that? I don't know. Uh, I, I would like to know, just asking for a friend. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, <laughs> asking for a share friend, you know, whatever. All right, coming up, you got a tale of two earnings for the obesity drug competition. Novo Nordis struggles with supply as Eli Lilly pulls ahead in the GLP-1 race. Is Eli Lilly also taking market share? I don't know. We're going to break that down next. Coming up on The Close, this is Bloomberg. around the highs of the session. Eli Lilly around the highs of the session. That stock moving the most since August of 2023. Reporting sales of their blockbuster weight loss drug, Zepbound, $1.2 billion in the second quarter. Just call it crushing Wall Street estimates. Yeah, and it's kind of interesting. Was this, uh, this was less of a demand issue all along, right? We kind of knew this was more about could they ramp up production and get these, what do you call them, injectable, injectable thing? I don't know. What are these people taking? It's like a little plastic thing you stick in you. But, but I guess they couldn't make enough of these things, right? <laughs> yeah. So now apparently they found a way to make that. So I'm still looking at the chart in our story. They still got a long way to go to catch up uh, with uh, Novo, but they're certainly getting there. My question is, like, is, is uh, Eli Lilly stealing Novo Nordisk's share? And I don't know if we know that yet, but that's my question. Yeah, it's a big question. But, but maybe they're new share, right? There's not that many. I mean, as much as we talk about this, there's still a pretty small percentage of people that are taking this stuff. It's still in the single digits. So in theory, a total addressable market that could be infinite. Yeah, sure. All right. Definitely. I <laughs> All don't right. know. That's a lot of market share. Yeah, that's a lot of market share. And of course, a lot of companies vying for that market share. Ozempic, of course, is at the top of the heat. That range is one of the top drugs used to tackle obesity. And it's under threat now, believe it or not, as Alex was saying from Eli Lilly. It's blockbuster Zepbound. Uh, we saw $1.2 billion in sales in the most recent quarter, well above Wall Street expectations, and this finally closing that gap with Novo Nordisk lineup. Joining us right now for more insights on that is Jared Holtz, healthcare equity strategist over at Mizuho. And Jared, let's talk about the quarter here. Uh, it certainly surprised a lot of people, pleasantly surprised a lot of people here. Should we expect that to continue? Hey, how are you? Thanks for having me. Um, yeah, upside surprise in the quarter. 
Um, we're still looking at a market that is in its infancy stages. This is the second full quarter of Zephbound sales for Eli Lilly. So a, a big number. This is a drug already annualizing uh, five billion just a couple quarters in. And I know you guys were talking earlier about market share and who's taking it from whom. This is a, a massive market. You know, pretty much everyone on the street believes this will be a hundred billion or higher. So I think it's less about market share. It's just more about building out the market, mm -hmm. availability of product, being able to manufacture it. All those things I think are, you know, coming into play as we head into the second half here. So there's room for everyone to play, basically, Jared. Is there a first mover advantage here or no? Yeah, I think there's a huge first mover advantage. We talk about all the competition. You've got a, you know, a laundry list of pharma companies and biotech companies vying for a position here um, in the clinic trying to get drugs to market. Um, but either way, Lilly and Novo are going to have a four-year head start um, at a bare minimum here. So yes, it's going to be a more crowded market over the long term. But for every passing day, I think that Lilly and Novo each have um, you know, a better um, position in this market as being first movers. G give me a sense here, Jared. Well, I mean, what, what's the end game here? Because I, I understand, I mean, would you, obviously you have a huge addressable market going from what's now low single uh, percentage uh, uptake right now to maybe potentially uh, above 10% over the next few years if you believe the industry forecast. But at some point, do these drugs evolve into something else or is this the product and this is only the product? Well, the product is so multifactorial, right? Like you have, you have the drugs that are designed for weight loss, but on the other hand, there are all these preventative measures that the drugs provide, whether it's cardiovascular health, uh, stroke prevention, heart failure prevention, kidney failure prevention. I mean, the list goes on and on. So I think when we look at this entire landscape of the GLP-1 market, we still don't exactly know what it's going to be. And into next year, I think you're going to hear a lot of analysts start to talk about what if the drugs work significantly well in Alzheimer's disease and other cognitive impairment situations across the po these populations. Yeah. So we, we truly don't know what the end market um, for either Novo Nordisk or Eli Lilly is going to be, but it, we're looking at massive numbers. And I think it's safe to say that the $100 billion mark that a lot of people have kind of estimated is, is going to be too low, and we're going to see this market go way higher than that. Hey, Jared, how much of this is also the more you get covered by insurance, the more the uptake is, but then the less you're making on, on each of the drugs? How much is this way? Uh, I think pricing for um, the drug is going to be, of course, a little bit less when it's covered by Medicare and Medicaid, but I, I feel like both companies would easily trade that pricing offset for volume. I, th to me, this is a volume game. Let's get this drug in as many patients as possible. The, the results speak for themselves. You're looking at close to 20% weight loss for both of these products. Um, they obviously have huge health benefits as secondary endpoints, and most patients are likely going to stay on them for you know, a year, two years, potentially more. So get yeah. the product in the hands of the patients and let the, the market kind of, um, you know, play out over time. But I, I really don't think that the pricing with respect to Medicare and Medicaid is a big deal in the context of what we're talking about. Gotcha. Volume, sales. Got it. Jared, thanks a lot. Jared Holtz over at Mizuho. We appreciate that. That segues perfectly in today's big take because America's weight loss capital isn't Manhattan, isn't Hollywood. It's Bowling Green, Kentucky. What? Joining us now. I know. Joining us now for more is Madison Muller, Bloomberg News Health reporter. First of all, everyone should read this piece. It was a really <laughs> wonderful look at how Ozempic and the weight loss drugs have just totally changed this town in Kentucky. Yeah, it was, I mean, it was really fun going there and meeting people and talking to people who were like, wow, we thought it would have been Hollywood or, or Manhattan as well, but now the more that we think about it, like everyone we know is on these drugs, our cousins, our aunts, uncles, friends, husbands, yeah. like it's just amazing. Is there a reason, so I saw the percentage wise, something like 4% of the population or something yeah. roughly was a number. Why, I mean, wh why, why is that so high? I mean, to start, so Kentucky yeah. as a state has the highest concentration of weight loss drug users. So that's why we kind of narrowed in on Bowling Green as being pretty well representative of, of the state of Kentucky and, and higher than and 
other places in the U.S. Is that, but, and that correlated with the rates of obesity? Exactly. Okay, yeah. Gotcha. So correlated yeah. with like yeah. Kentucky has very high obesity rates. Yeah. Bowling Green has high obesity and diabetes rates. And yeah. so it makes sense that a lot of the prescriptions are going to this place. Mm. There were also a lot of large employers that were covering the drugs in uh, the area. And yeah. so that helped with accessibility. Since, you know, I guess since more people were going on these yeah. drugs, they've it's, pulled back a little bit because it's just so expensive. But is there like peer pressure, though? Like if, if all your neighbors are on it then you right. feel like, and they're all losing weight, then you feel like I got to get on it, too? I mean, maybe. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I might think so, right? Like I read your article, like a lot of family members talk to family members and therefore exactly. it kind of spread. But because of that, is there a supply issue? And you talked a lot about the compound drugs now and sort of the knockoffs. Walk us through that. Yeah. So, I mean, supply issues have been plaguing this weight loss market for over a year now. And across the board, across the US, the drugs are difficult to find. That's no different in Bowling Green. A lot of people are struggling to find supply of the drugs in stock. Um, but what's happening is, is there are these compounding pharmacies, medical spas that are sort of coming in to fill in the gaps. Medical spas. Yeah, so mm -hmm. the medical spas are, are selling these compounded drugs, which are like knockoff copycat versions of the medications. And in Bowling Green, there are a lot of them cropping up yeah. to help patients who are, you know, no longer able to afford the drugs or can't find them in the pharmacy. Yeah. And so that's been a huge part of this, like, booming Ozempic economy in Bowling the Green. The booming Ozempic economy. Uh, is that, like, have you looked at the uh, food economy? Has, have, like, restaurant yes. uh, sales gone down? We thought that yeah. that's what we would see. But actually, like, the restaurants are still yeah. doing pretty well. From talking to people there, they say they still go out to eat. Food's such a big part of Southern culture. And so they're just eating half of what they used to before. And then taking a doggy bag home and saving the rest for lunch the next day. Okay. Um, all right. Although I'll quibble with uh, Southern culture there. Uh, as a, With the family members from the South, they will quibble as to whether Kentucky is really <laughs> a part of that. No disrespect to Kentucky. True. A great story, uh, Madison Muller, on the uh, uh, Bloomberg Terminal right now, taking a look at the town in America, uh, Alex, that has... Uh, one of the uh, highest rates of uh, uh, weight loss drug use, GLP-1 use. It was a really great article. Yeah. You guys should definitely uh, yeah. check it out. Yeah, absolutely. And McKesson, uh, yeah. that stock is one of the worst yeah. performers on the S&P, so let's stay with that theme for just a second. Uh, it's a healthcare distributor, and the results were really weighed down in part by supply chain shortages of... Ozempic, da -da -da, weight loss drugs. Weight loss drugs, yeah. <laughs> and it's interesting, too, because the, the shortage, just to be clear, the shortage isn't necessarily the drug itself. It's the injection mechanism, mm -hmm. right? I, I, that was my understanding, that it's that you can make the actual chemical that, that goes into this, but it's the delivery method that is holding things up. Well, also, I think it just raises the question, too. This is like a structural shift in society, right? It's like a structural shift that we're using these drugs, but it's still going to be a cyclical market based on the supply chain issues or whatever we're dealing with. And, and as an investor, be, how I, do you deal with that? Well, I think it's going to be an onswell. I mean, there's a lot of people sitting on the sidelines, including, you know, present company included, who's just um, we want, we're basically waiting for all the guinea pigs to, like, you know, make sure no one drops dead. And then, you know, maybe we'll all decide, hey, you know, I want to lose 20 pounds and look a little bit better. Right. So then yeah. the point is, it like then yeah. like 11 percent or 12 percent down yeah. from McKesson? Is that yeah. justified in that environment no. and remains waiting? I, I don't know. I, I, I think a 12 percent drop, I think you're going to see a snapback at some point pretty quickly when people uh, come yeah. to their senses here. Still uh, interesting moves. Uh, and I love the, the phrase uh, either you or Madison used, the Olympic economy here. Uh, coming back, a closer look at the state of the consumer, a closer look at the turnaround well, we're at Under Armour, a huge move in the shares today, one of the best days in years. This after better than expected earnings results is our stock of the hour, and it's up next. This is Bloomberg. Time now for our stock of the hour. We're taking a closer look at Under Armour. The shares out in front on the day here. One of the best days in years after the company reported results that beat expectations. A rosy report coming as the firm continues that restructuring plan under its returning co-founder, Kevin Plank. Abigail Doolittle joining us right now for our stock of the hour. Uh, this is quite the turnaround story. A lot of people have left this company, this stock for dead, particularly after Kevin Plank left uh, the first time around here. He came back. It was kind of a lukewarm reception when he came back, but the results are starting to show up. They are starting yeah. to show up. Today's reaction, I think, is all about Kevin Plank, because mm -hmm. apparently on the conference call, he was extremely optimistic and basically saying, uh, we know that we have an issue here, uh, but because we know we have a pro 
problem, we can come up with the solution. So relative to the quarter that was, uh, they put up sales of $1.2 billion. That was 4% better than what was expected. It was still down 10%, and that was a little bit uh, disappointing. But international, better than North America. Wholesale, stronger than direct-to-consumer. They did, you were mentioning the restructuring, so they yeah. did uh, lay off some of the people that were expected to be laid off. They took a $25 million charge for that. Uh, but in terms of what he's saying that they need to do, all sorts of things, uh, but one of them is really talking about the direct-to-consumer, that this is going to be a big source of future growth. Not a lot of discounting there. They really didn't do a lot of promotions, uh, but that is why uh, full-price sales rose significantly. So I think that that's one of the keys that they see f going forward. Also, I don't know, short covering? Short interest had increased uh, yes. in June, too. So Great I wonder. point. In terms of the stock's reaction today, absolutely. There's a 13% short interest on this stock. So I think some of those shorts are scared that Kevin Plank back in, yeah. people now taking him seriously. Some of the other initiatives he's talking about, well, well let's go back to the big one, improve the product. You know, that's well, a, and it. Well, that's that's a big thing. I mean, yes, it is. About that, because that was what really killed the stock. Yes. The, the, the product got stale, and yes. at least in the eyes of a lot of folks who were shopping. They looked at Nike. They looked at some of the other brands out so there. So many options. And it was like, you know, why why Under Armour? And he was very clear about that today on the yeah. call, that it's this is no longer, we can't just rely on yeah. the brand. We're going to rely on the and product. It's such in. a great story, too, right? I mean, like, I remember I was living in Maryland at the time when that came out, about, and he just kind of. Took yeah. it by storm. Yeah and, yeah, and like took on Nike out of nowhere. Yeah. Insane. All right, Abigail, Wasn't that thanks when you went to Roadhouse Really Steakhouse appreciate too? it. Huh? Coming up, we're counting down to the close. Virginia. We're looking at oh, record, okay. near right highs of the session for the S&P. It, it is significant to know when there's a, a hypersensitive market move to a really mundane number. It tells you that things are really um, precarious. Otherwise, uh, I would never have done anything like that. Yeah, the hypersensitivity of this market really on display today. That was Bryce Doty over at Sid Investments. He helped kick us off to the close about 50 minutes ago. And this is a market that took a look at weekly jobless claims data, some of the most noisy official data that we get, and decided that it was off to the races. Everything was copacetic again. Look, we're sitting on almost 3% gains right now on the NASDAQ, 2% on the S&P. I do wonder if this is going to reverse sometime soon. I completely yeah. agree with that. Um, you have, what, the S&P is rallying the most since July uh, of 2020, no, excuse me, January of 2023. Is that really sustainable? So it just shows me that we're just going to have a lot more volatility, right? Like we're still at 24 on the VIX. If we have a lot more volatility, do you have to readjust your portfolio and manage your value at risk? And how do you do that? What's the outcome of that? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the VIX in at 27. And when you look at the move index, uh, that also uh, tracks bond market volatility also elevated right mm -hmm. around 113 as we move closer to the closing bells here in New York. Just about eight and a half minutes to go. Ellen Hazen joining us right now, chief market strategist and portfolio manager over at FL Putnam. Ellen, I just want you to put on your economist hat for a second. I know you're not an economist, but we all pretend that we are on this program. When you sort of try to assess where we're going economically and the feed through to the Fed and, of course, the feed through into markets here, did you gain any real confidence over these last couple of weeks in what the economic picture is? Thanks for having me, Romaine. The economic picture continues to look positive, but it's getting increasingly cloudy. So what do I mean by that? GDP for second quarter, as we saw, was very strong at 2.8%. But if we look at estimates for third quarter, uh, it's slowing down to about 1.5% for each of the next two quarters, and then reaccelerating again next year, according to analyst estimates. What is going to drive that? I think what has driven it to slow down now is the fact that most of the excess savings in the households have been used up, and the job market is weakening a little bit. It's not weak with a capital W, but it is not as amazingly strong as it was for most of last year and even the first part of this year. If you think about GDP, back to our economist uh, Econ 101, it's mm -hmm. C plus I plus G, right? And if the consumer is running out of steam or at least softening us a little bit, as we saw with some of the luxury good makers, the investment looks okay. Yeah. Uh, but, and, and the G is actually accelerating based on the Infrastructure and Chips yeah. Act. It looks okay, but softer than it was a few months ago. Yeah, C plus I plus G. You're giving me flashbacks here to my econ <laughs> class. I can never sort of make heads or tails out of the export-import stuff. Uh, I am curious, though, Ellen. Uh, there's a great story in the Bloomberg Terminal kind of talking about this idea that this earnings season has actually been 
a lot better than maybe what it looks in aggregate. The idea that the benefit to the aggregate market isn't necessarily there, but on an idiosyncratic basis, a stock-by-stock basis here, there's a lot to love here. And I'm wondering whether this earnings season, which is still going on, but this earnings season, have you been encouraged by what you've heard out of these companies? It's been a mixed picture, to be honest. First of all, looking at the aggregate numbers, although earnings have beat in in line with historic averages, revenue has been a little softer than expected. Guidance has been a little bit softer than expected. And we have heard a couple of common themes coming out of companies. Number one, that the consumer is under a little bit of pressure. And number two, that demand from China is slowing. So I think that there are a lot of good companies. I think there are a lot of good companies reporting earnings and good earnings reports. But it's not as uniformly good as it was a couple of quarters ago. And to your point, we had had a 15, 16, 17 percent increase in the S&P up until a few days ago, Mm -hmm. and that didn't leave any room for error. Now that we've uh, come back a little bit, I think it's a little bit safer for stocks. But I think it was just as much about the expectations as it was about the actual earnings, which were okay, pretty good, a little squishy. Right. On the P.E., the price has finally revamped a little bit, which isn't the worst thing. So do you want to buy, say, tech growth stocks or more cyclical oriented stocks? I think with cyclicals, you want to be a little bit careful. There are some cyclicals that are exposed to Chips and Infrastructure Act and other secular growth drivers Mm -hmm. like the electricity grid growth that I think are good ideas. But classic cyclicals, I think you want to wait until we have more visibility on the likelihood that that GDP acceleration into 25 is actually going to occur. Um, in, in terms of large cap tech, I do like those names. I think that they've given up a lot of performance just in the last few days. Uh, and certainly over the month of July, they give up some performance. But you can't argue with the earnings growth there. And right. even though the stocks might have been a little bit squishy, the revenue and the earnings and the cash flow is coming through for those names. So I think those are something to hang on to here. So if you're taking a look at, say, large cap tech or the cyclicals that are exposed to those real trends, they've had a huge run. So you just buy in any dip. Is that the idea? That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And what we've seen a lot of companies come into buyable territory over the last few days. And so I think that there is an opportunity if you have your shopping list ready to go ahead and do that on this weakness. Ellen, always great to talk to you. Ellen Hazen, chief market strategist and portfolio manager over at FL Putnam. All right, we are counting you down uh, to the closing bells here. We actually, Alex, have uh, quite a few uh, earnings uh, coming out uh, after the bell, uh, including from uh, some smaller names that we follow, like uh, Take-Two, Unity Software. But also, we are going to get some uh, relatively big ones, Expedia, Sweetgreen, Lionsgate, and Paramount. And I was just taking a look here. Uh, at least three of those names on that board are major laggards uh, relative to the broader market, including Paramount, uh, Lionsgate, and Expedia. Each one of those down at least 20%. Sweetgreen, though, is more than double this year. I don't get it. I, I don't know. get it. You don't get it. Have twenty bucks salad. There? Well, that's why they. That's why they're. It that's why they're. I know. I know. I mean, double. I just don't get yeah. why you'd pay twenty bucks for that salad. But yeah. people do when they love it, and it's weird. Anyway, but you know, to your Expedia point, uh, Bookings Holdings was was not great, and they're seeing a sort of a trade down effect yeah. in the U.S. So, what does Expedia think and say about that? And and we were talking earlier about some of the restaurants and some of the softness there. I mean, mm-hmm. if they're feeling it, you would think travel would also be feeling it because that is kind of one of the more ultimate discretionary spends out. Just there. look at Disney. Yeah, exactly. I mean, like the price yeah. sensitivity now uh, to parks. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, a few others, well, Elf Beauty, a few others, and maybe give us a read here. Uh, something that just crossed the wire, kind of unrelated to earnings, but it also caught my attention, was the money market assets. Remember we used to talk about that all the time? Ooh, yes. That's still at a record high. Uh, these are the weekly numbers that come in, still at about $6.2 uh, trillion. That still hasn't come down. Remember the cash on the sidelines that was going to come in, sweep into this market and help lift things? Yeah, nope. people still clinging to... Uh, but did they wind up selling stuff because of the uh, because of the volatility and because of the carry trade unwind and then par- parking it in cash and then going to put it to work? Or is this just money that's going to be staying in cash as savings in essence? Well, the weekly numbers have basically been at or near records now, basically for the last couple of years. So we haven't seen a meaningful drop down in that. And I do wonder if we do start to see it, where does that money go? Because that was the big parlor game. Is it going to flood into the equity market or is it just going to go somewhere else in fixed income? And how long, how much, how many cuts do we need to see from the Fed to get that money to move? Yeah, absolutely here. Right now, looking at stocks not far from the highs of the day. An S&P up about 2%. Your NASDAQ indices up, up roughly 3% on the day. The Philadelphia Semiconductor Index up 6.5. A full breakdown of all your market coverage right now on Bloomberg. The Closing Bell, Bloomberg's comprehensive cross-platform coverage of the U.S. market close starts right now. 
And right now we are two minutes away from the end of the trading day. Romain Bostic here with Alex Steele taking you through the closing bell. It's a global simulcast. It starts right now. Carol Masser and Matt Miller joining us from the radio booth. Scarlett Fu and Tim Senevic off on this day. We welcome our audiences across all of our Bloomberg platforms, including our partnership with YouTube. Yeah. Remember, Carol Masser, what? Monday we were looking at what? One of the worst days for stocks in a couple of years. And today we're looking at one of the best days for stocks in a couple of years. Exactly. Right. What a wow. World. I'm calling it the Manic Market Week because it really feels that way, right? On Monday, everybody was, or not everybody, but some people were saying we need an emergency Fed cut. I just said to Matt, I'm looking forward to September 18th, that next Fed meeting, because that's when we're going to ultimately know kind of where we go. I'm looking forward to September 6th, which is the next non-farm payrolls number. I think that's really what set us off on Friday. And you know, we had a number this morning on the labor market that looked a little bit healthier, and that's one of the reasons that we continue um, to be up near the end of the close today. I have such a hard time believing that jobless claims alone lifted the equity market, and I know what yes. the, chart, the, the chart shows me, mm. but it just makes me feel like, were we going to go there anyway based on the market action? I mean, we faded so hard to the close yesterday. I'm still skeptical. I love this. This is like, you know, remember when we were all, everyone was trading off jolts and all these other little things that, that, that were noisy and didn't matter? Are we back to that now? I don't know. No, yeah. maybe. I don't, but yes, no. yes, we are. Because you know what? <laughs> Yesterday you had a bad auction, treasury auction, and that's what turned us over. If you watch mm -hmm. the charts today, we had a pretty weak treasury auction, too. And we continue to rise because of those jobless claims. Yeah, absolutely. Well, at least for one day here, the market has a reason to celebrate here. We'll see whether this actually holds into Friday and the rest of the week. Uh, but basically, you have about 90 percent of the S&P in the green. That's going to help it close up by more than 100 points or about 2.3 percent as we wait for these numbers to settle. The Dow Jones Industrial Average up almost 700 points of 1.8 percent. The Nasdaq Composite up about 2.9 percent, a 3 percent gain for the Nasdaq 100, a 6.5 percent gain for the Philadelphia Semiconductor Index and the Russell 2000 getting in on the action as well, Carol, yeah. higher on the day by 49 points or 2.4 percent. Yeah, pretty significant. S&P 500 most names in that index. Alex higher today, about 457 gaining ground, and you only had about 45 to the downside. Yeah, I'm just looking at the pie, the IMAP, right? It's just basically green with a teeny bit of red. It is a full green pizza with a sprinkling of tomato. But volume <laughs> is also really light, too, guys. So I'm having a really hard time taking this price action seriously. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I don't know. I just feel like we've been whipsawed uh, throughout. If you've got to sell stock, then you're going to take it real seriously. Well, hey, guys, uh, yeah. sorry, just interrupt. We've got Paramount earnings crossing the wire right now. Yeah, let's get to it. And uh, here's and, the big headline, yeah, right? The ahead. second quarter results, including, you know, another one with charges, 5.98 billion charge for those cable networks and remains. So that story, that narrative, mm -hmm. Warner Brothers discovery last night, that concern that those TV networks, the value, it just isn't there anymore. And we continue to see write downs. Yeah, you look at the net, uh, the TV revenue in the quarter coming in light, 4.27 billion in the most recent quarter, their direct to consumer revenue. This is basically the streaming business also coming in light, $1.9 uh, billion here. Uh, so this is not necessarily a growth story, uh, even subscriber growth. Total subscribers right now uh, to Paramount Plus at 68 million. The street was looking for 71 million. And then, as you just mentioned, Carol, of course, that big charge, that write down of assets, six billion dollars. You compare that to the nine million over at Warner Brothers. And, yeah, if you're in the linear TV business, um, <clears throat> Uh, yeah, not looking. It's got to be yeah. some solace to, Z to David Zasloff, right? Because his stock has been hit all day um, because of the light TV advertising number, but really because of the $9.1 billion write down that they reported yesterday. So today, Paramount does something very similar, not the same in size, but about two thirds of a percent. And you see the shares, what are they bouncing back and forth between gains and losses? And right now, only down 1%, but maybe that's because it was priced in. Paramount was one of the biggest losers on the S&P 500 already today mm -hmm. because of, uh, I guess, sympathy with the Warner Brothers report yesterday. I have to say, though, guys, revenue at the streaming services, it did jump 13 percent to 1.88 uh, billion. Now, they did lose some subscribers due to the end of a distribution agreement with South Korea's uh, TV, but nonetheless, you did have that revenue jump 13 percent to 1.88 billion. Yeah, and they're also talking about cost savings. They say some commentary. Looking ahead, we'll, we will continue to aggressively execute our strategic plan, which focuses on transforming streaming
streaming to accelerate profitability, streamlining our organization, including at least $500 million in annualized cost savings and improving the balance sheet by growing free cash flow and optimizing our asset mix. So listen, they're focusing too on cutting costs. A lot of other earnings coming out now, including from Expedia, a beat on the top and bottom line. At least that's the initial read here. Adjusted EPS in the most recent quarter, $3.51. Street was looking for $3.12. Revenue in the quarter, a beat as well, $3.56 billion. A beat on cash flow as well. I'm not quite seeing any guidance here, but of course, a lot of people really tuned in uh, to what these travel agencies are doing, given some of the concerns about softness in consumer spending. Looking at the total gross bookings coming at $28.8 billion. It's slightly above estimates, and it's an increase 6% uh, on a year-on-year -year basis there. Yeah, I'm looking at the press release, too, and they're talking about, you know, they talk about that 6% uh, growth in gross bookings, revenue growing 6%, pleased with their momentum and the sequential improvement in their consumer brands. However, they say in July, we have seen a more challenging macro environment and a softening in travel demand. We are therefore adjusting our expectations for the rest of this year. Uh, that coming from the CEO of Expedia. Yeah. Oops. And, is right. and it sounds a lot like we, what we heard from Trip a couple of days ago. It sounds a lot like what we heard from Airbnb um, yesterday. So, uh, it does look like in terms of making bookings and travel, bigger ticket spend, it's hard for the consumer right now. All right, let's uh, actually go back, of uh, course, uh, to one of the uh, most talked about stocks out there, and that is Paramount. The shares moving slightly higher here in after hours trading. And I wanted to go back to this idea here as to sort of what the turnaround is. I mean, we know the Skydance deal still going to take some time, of course, uh, for this to close and for some of the changes by Ellison to get made here. But the big question is sort of what is the future of this company? Is it this sort of conglomerate that it once was, or is it going to be broken up into something else here? Because when you look at that write down, $6 billion, and we're talking about acquisitions that were just made in the last five years for Paramount, for Warner Brothers, it was in the last two years, and you're already writing those down. Yeah, I mean, that's that's a great way of phrasing it. It's like they're making money on streaming. Uh, their streaming subscriber growth it, it is good if you just discount what happened over in South Korea. They're making money off of it, but that linear TV just can't seem to make it. But what are you going to do about that? Uh, and ha how do you break that up? How do you monetize it? And I, clearly these guys don't have the answers I, yet. Just and one, one point on that, too. I know we're mm -hmm. focusing on the TV revenue, which was awful, down 17%. But then as their theatrical revenue was also down. And then, of course, their filmed entertainment revenue was also down as well by double-digit percentages here. So this is a company that almost across the board is struggling. Yeah, all right, let's go to Sweet Green here because uh, those earnings are out as well. So the loss per share in the second quarter came in at 13 uh, loss per share. There, the revenue coming in at 184.6 million. That is better than expected. Revenue beating estimates, guys. You all like those $25 salads, I and love they're making sweet the money. Green. Well, why really? Like, you can't get a salad for less than I don't that. go a lot, but I really do like it. By the way, I go to Sweet Green almost every day, and I've never paid $25 for the salad. 20? So you might be going to the wrong one. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> I still think they're really expensive. But fair enough. I mean, they're clearly making the revenue for it there. You look stock up over 10%. All right, another stock uh, out uh, right now, Lionsgate, of course, the filmmaker coming out with their earnings. Not a whole lot of change in their shares in after hours trading, a loss uh, in the most recent quarter of about 25 cents a share, which is better uh, than the loss that they had a year ago here. Uh, EPS in the quarter, we should point out, coming in right around nine cents. Uh, the street was looking for, uh, on an adjusted basis, excuse me, coming in at nine cents. The street was looking for 4.2. Revenue, uh, Matt, coming in light, 834 million. Street was looking for 857. I think this uh, energy Entertainment, this block of entertainment companies reporting is just so fascinating. And, you, you know, Alex was pointing out that at Paramount they had uh, growth in streaming. At Warner Brothers Discovery, don't remember, they had growth in streaming as well. Ad revenue from streaming at Warner Brothers doubled to $240 million. Mm -hmm. So they're doing well with streaming. It's just the linear TV assets. And the question about what they're going to do, what they're going to do is write them down and probably try and split them off, which is what Warner Brothers is already looking to do in the first place. You wonder if it's the same thing if... Um, uh, what's the name of the Oracle guy, his Oracle. kid? Oh, yeah, 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 if he's yeah, going to yeah. do that with Paramount yeah, yeah. as well. Well, and what's interesting, I'm looking at Lionsgate. Go back there if we can. We're pleased to report a solid quarter despite unprecedented industry disruption, the after effects of the strikes. And they say their uh, motion picture group stars and their library performed well, uh, though financial results in their TV segment reflected a heavily backloaded year. So, you know, I feel a little bit of a theme here, guys. Yeah, but let's not like oversell like the film part, like the filmed entertainment uh, revenue over at Paramount, for example. Mm -hmm. That was still down 18 percent year on year, coming in at 679 million because you know what? They didn't have Inside Out 2 and they didn't have Deadpool. <laughs>
<laughs> Not that that would have counted for now. I'm just, I'm just, this is my point to talk about Deadpool. That's all. All right, guys, just watching some of these move. Uh, Paramount right now up about 1% here in the aftermarket. But who doesn't love Have Deadpool? we all seen Deadpool? Have you seen Deadpool? Yeah. yeah. I haven't seen it yet. Oh, my God, it's so good. I love that you love this stuff. I Uh, love this stuff. Expedia down about 3 4% here in the aftermarket. All right, maybe there's a road trip for all of us. All right, that is a wrap. Our cross-platform coverage. Um, A road trip? What, like across the street? Well, yeah. yeah. (laughs) (laughs) All right, so it's a little walk across the street. Our cross-platform, radio, TV, YouTube, Bloomberg Originals. We call it the closing bell. Guys, we will see you same time, same place tomorrow. All right, stick with us. A lot more coverage coming up here on the close of breakdown of all the earnings that we're getting here in After Hours Trading. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to The Close. I'm Romain Bostic. A look at how markets closed out here on the day and what is continuing the wild week here in the United States. Remember, the S&P 500 on Monday posted its worst one-day loss going back to September of 2022. The numbers you're looking at on the screen today, that's your best gain since November of 2022. Two. Volume and volatility remaining elevated, though, but tech still leading the charge. The Sox rallying almost 7% here on the day. In fact, the 10 best performers of the NASDAQ 100 and at least six of the best performers in the S&P were all chip or chip-related stocks. If you flip it up, though, one interesting note, though, is that probably the biggest gainer in the S&P was a decidedly old economy stock, Parker Hannifin, rallying the most since 2020. Uh, this after the industrial manufacturer guided for positive organic EPS growth there. Monster Energy actually dropping the most going back to 2018. A lot of investors really starting to question uh, some of those price increases that we have seen out of Monster, Celsius, and some of the other energy drink makers. And uh, down there at the bottom, take a look at Clavio. This is the Shopify-backed software company. It was the sixth largest IPO back in 2023. And at $30.78 a share, a 33% gain on the day, it finally, finally return to its IPO price. Remember, it actually came to market, not through an IPO, but through a SPAC uh, back uh, a couple of years ago. Let's turn now to the big story of the day, and that is the continued cash burn of tech companies chasing that AI dream, a race to build ever bigger and costlier artificial intelligence models using an exponential amount of online data. But a startup co-founded last year by Mark McQuaid called uh, RC is betting on a tinier approach to AI, small language models. Rather than trying to do everything ChatGPT can, RC software helps accomplish a more limited set of day-to-day corporate tasks, like building a service that say only fields tax-related questions. It's one of a growing number of companies that are really starting to rethink the conventional wisdom that had every startup one-upping each other to develop more powerful large language models. Anthropic CEO had predicted that it was actually gonna cost $100 billion just to train models compared to the $100 million cost today. Now, that corporate spend on AI was central to the narrative of the equity market rally that began last October, and it's been a big part of the story around the market stress that we've seen in recent weeks. For most analysts on Wall Street, they see this, though, as normal growing pains for a burgeoning industry still trying to find its footing. One of those companies trying to claim its piece of the AI pie is SoundHound, which developed speech and language recognition software used by companies like Stellantis. Since going public through a SPAC back in 2021, SoundHound has averaged roughly 50% revenue growth each quarter. Its latest earnings report, just crossing the Bloomberg terminal moments ago, in the most recent quarter, 54% revenue growth. That was in the second quarter, and while the company is still unprofitable on a gap basis, it did update its revenue guidance for this year and next. Guidance? that for 2024 shows sales potentially coming in at least 10% above current consensus estimates and 2025 revenue potentially coming in as much as 50% above expectations. Kayvon Mojadir joining us right now. He's the co-founder and CEO of SoundHound to talk about a really interesting quarter. The growth is still there, Kayvon, so congratulations on that. Have you at all decided to try to articulate some sort of path to profitability or is that still too soon? Oh, well, first, thank you for having me back. It's great to be here. Um, yeah, it's, a, it's something that we constantly recalibrate. There is a lot of opportunities ahead of us, um, and um, uh, we need to invest in growth, but we are also uh, looking at our spending and, and uh, our financial strength. Um, we expect, we do expect that uh, next year's revenue will be over 150 million, and uh, we expect that uh, we'll be 
um, I just said EBITDA positive uh, in the second half of uh, 2025. So when we talk about the growth that you're starting to see in terms of on the revenue side here, I am curious. There's been a lot of discussion, as I'm sure you know, about the amount of money uh, that end customers are spending on these AI models, on these data servers and other things here. Have you seen any of your customers, your existing customers, start to pull back at all in their spend? Not at all. Uh, so, that, so there's two separate things. One is uh, investment in infrastructure and companies building foundation models. Um, and then there is investment in adoption of uh, generative AI and uh, um, um, things like customer service or digital assistance. Uh, we are very much in the, in the second category and we are only seeing uh, the demand increase. For example, historically, we are in automotive, and uh, there's constant pressure from uh, automotive OEMs to, inc to decrease their costs. Mm -hmm. uh, but for the first time, we are seeing their willingness to pay more. Uh, when we offer them generative AI upgrades, yeah. they're willing to increase their royalty to, in, to deliver much better uh, experience to their users. I, I noticed Stellantis is one of your big customers. I know at some point, I know Mercedes was involved. I don't know if you still have a relationship with them. But you seem to have had a, a lot of inroads in the automotive space. Why, why are you finding that those companies are uh, more in tune to, I guess, your product, which we should point out before our viewers, is specifically centered around speech and sort of language recognition? And sound, sense, sound, sound, sound. Uh, well, we are in automotive, we are in TVs, we are in IoT devices, we are also in AI customer service. Um, we started in automotive, we are 20 years old. Uh, we started in automotive because years ago you didn't need to convince automotive companies that they need voice. Uh, that we just needed to convince them that they need a better voice. And in just a few years, uh, we now power more than uh, 20 brands in automotive. Uh, we are in over 20 markets, we support dozens of languages. And then we are also very strong in AI customer service. And that's an area that we see um, really room for disruption. The legacy IVRs and things that you press one or say yes or no, that's all going to go away. Generative AI is going to change that. And that's a big part of our growth. Uh, so talk a little bit more about that. So when we talk about the customer service side of this, are we talking about we were just showing on screen there a drive through at a fast food restaurant? Is that sort of the core customer for that? Or is it other types of companies? Uh, yeah, we started in restaurants. Uh, and uh, the, the way we thought about it, it was uh, restaurants to us were like books were to Amazon. Uh, they start with books, now they sell everything. I mean, we thought let's start with restaurants and then expand. And we've done really well in restaurants. We are now over in, 10, in over 10,000 locations. Uh, we work with uh, five of the top 15 quick service restaurants. Uh, last quarter, we signed up two new QSRs. We signed up one of the largest uh, pizza chains. Um, and um, this morning, we announced uh, that we bought an amazing company called Emilia. Mm -hmm. uh, they are also in conversational AI for customer service. That's a big area of growth for us. Uh, there was a study by McKinsey that uh, enterprise spending on conversational AI is going to surpass or is going to reach $250 billion in just three years. Um, and uh, by buying Emilia, we are now going into more verticals. Now we are in healthcare, we are in financial services, insurance, hospitality, retail, and more. Have you at all? been approached at all with acquisition opportunities, meaning to sell SoundHound to a bigger company? Uh, well, we have bought three companies, um, and um, uh, we are very proud of the acquisitions we have, we've made. Uh, we haven't disclosed uh, any specific acquisition offers to us, but we are 20 years old, so uh, you can imagine that that happens. All right. Uh, we're going to have to leave it there. Kayvon, always appreciate you uh, jumping on for us. Uh, those earnings on SoundHound just crossing the wire right now. Kayvon Mohajir, co-founder and CEO over at SoundHound AI. Those shares higher by about 6% here in After Hours Trading. Also moving here in After Hours Trading is Expedia. Those shares moving to the downside here. We're going to take a deeper dive into what's actually ailing the travel sector. Clint Henderson of The Point Sky going to be joining us next. This is The Close on Bloomberg. season is here. They're seeing back-to-back billion-dollar-plus quarters. The forward indicators were so positive. Bloomberg is first to break the numbers. Texas Instruments app, folks. Goldman Sachs. Taking a look at Mattel. There is something for everybody. With the smartest insights. People are whitewashing AI. Wallets are under pressure. We are committed to EVs. They're going to happen. Earnings season in full swing. We will have full and instant analysis. Continuing coverage on Bloomberg. 
Context changes everything. All right, welcome back. Uh, following earnings here in the after hours trade, Expedia earnings are out here. They did beat on several key metrics, but the street really focusing in on the company warning of some potentially soft demand up ahead. The shares down just about 2% right now. The results are really wrapping up what has been a big focus on travel this week. Remember, we had earnings earlier out of Hilton, Hyatt, TripAdvisor, Airbnb, not to mention, of course, those Disney earnings that showed a lot of softness at its theme parks. Clint Henderson knows more about the travel space than almost anybody. He's managing editor over at The Points Guy, and he joins us here in Studio 2 in New York. So we just got Expedia earnings. We had booking the other day here, and they both seem to be singing from the same hymnal here that, yeah, there's still growth, but not what it used to be. What's happening? Yeah, I think you're finally starting to see some softening in Mm -hmm. demand. So the consumer is getting tapped out. And coming out of the pandemic, we saw just insane amounts of uh, leisure travelers. Business travel hadn't really come back yet. That has now come back. But that leisure traveler is finally starting to give some price resistance. They're saying, I already went to Hawaii, I already went to Florida, I went to Disney, I went to Europe, maybe I don't need to go. So we're starting to see some rationalization in the travel space. And we also, I mean, just a couple of weeks ago, we got the earnings out of the airlines themselves. Mm-hmm. And I think most of most of the major ones, certainly United, Delta, and American, kind of alluded to this, that they mm-hmm. were seeing uh, that some of their projections for the summer probably weren't going to be met. Their earlier projections for the summer weren't going to be met. Is this temporary, or do you think this is going to ride out through this year and maybe into next? I think the key here is that we're returning to normal. So normal, yeah. you're also getting the airlines, especially getting capacity back up. So mm-hmm. they have more seats available, mm. so they don't have the pricing power that they may have had one or two years ago. Mm. So that's what you're starting to see. So you're seeing some resistance from consumers. You're also seeing more capacity, yeah. and you're seeing a normalization of demand, and are, all that's combined. When are we going to see more deals, Clint? Because I think that's what everybody wants to know. Asking for a friend. You are yeah. seeing deals right now. Like <laughs> yeah. you could yeah. not two years ago, you would not have gone to Paris last minute for yeah. $500. I'm routinely seeing flights under 500 round trip to Europe. Mm-hmm. Uh, Hawaii's on sale. Even Florida, the theme park. So mm-hmm. we're seeing some normal normalization and the hotels are telling us they're going to start cutting prices giving you a free night if you book two nights so that's the kind of promotion you're going to see yeah you mentioned theme parks we had disney results Mm -hmm. the other day and at least for their theme park side of the business it was not good at all i know that that's always been an expensive vacation for families Mm -hmm. but it's one of those vacations if you have kids you kind of have to do at some point (laughs) uh, in your life here do you think that we'll see disney universal some of the other big theme park operators also start to compete a little bit better on price I think what you're going to see is special offers. You're not going to see cheaper tickets necessarily, Mm -hmm. but you'll see where if you stay at a local hotel, they'll give you a third night free, or maybe they give you a a food pass or a restaurant uh, free meal or something like that. That's Mm -hmm. the promotion you're going to be seeing. But like you said, you know, they're just not seeing the demand. You're, they're not seeing the number of, of people who want to go to Disney, want to go to Universal, and you're starting to see that in the impacts. We also had uh, results out of Airbnb uh, earlier this week, and this gets to the hotel question. I know yeah. Airbnb is not technically a hotel, but they showed a significant softness there. And some of their commentary, it wasn't very good. I mean, they seemed to suggest that not only were people, fewer people staying, but the people that were staying in their properties weren't staying for as many days as maybe what they were, I don't know, a year or two ago. You're also seeing yeah. prices People do not want to pay a $100 cleaning fee and all the fees they tack on. And I think for a while, Airbnb was a bargain. That hasn't been the case for some time. So people are aware of that. And people are not going to pay $700 a night for an Airbnb or a hotel, maybe, as much as they were a year or two ago. Yeah, we're not going to pay $700 if they have to clean their own room. Right? I mean, because we all do that. We we all do that math where we look at what the Airbnb costs versus what a hotel will cost. And you're right. I mean, you know, five, six years before the pandemic, I mean, Airbnb was a steal. And now it's like you see it's more expensive. And it's like, I got to do all I got to do all the work around here as well. Um, (laughs) Give me a sense here, too. Like, I mean, are there certain like uh, regions or certain routes and uh, destinations that maybe are going to be a little bit more favorable to travel? in terms of uh, cost and availability? Absolutely. Yeah. So if you've wanted to go to Hawaii, I just wrote about Maui today. It's the year anniversary of the fire that tore through there. Yeah. Demand is down 25% for Maui. Flights under $300. Uh, you can even find some hotel deals. So if you've had your eye on a place like Hawaii or even Florida that were really exorbitant during the pandemic, right out of the pandemic, mm-hmm. Las Vegas, yeah. we're starting to see some more normalcy and mm-hmm. some rational 
reasons to go. You mentioned Paris earlier. What about going overseas? Oh my gosh, Paris yeah. has been such a deal. Yeah. I think they didn't get the number of people going there that they were expecting. For so the Olympics, you've seen, yeah. yeah, you've seen warnings from Air France, for example. I think Delta have pointed to mm -hmm. flights down there being down. But you can fly to Paris under 500 and find some decent deals on hotels as well. And just real quickly, from a seasonal perspective, are we, do you think we're going to see a pickup? Do we normally see a pickup towards the end of the year, given the holiday season? We do. Yeah. So you'll get that holiday demand. Mm -hmm. Yeah. that's really intense and then it really dies off in January, February. Mm -hmm. uh, but for fall, if you can travel during the fall, you'll save 25 to 40 percent a lot of times yeah. on flights and hotels and it's off season so there's not you're not dealing with the crowds. So yeah. I love shoulder season travel. Yeah. If you can travel in yeah. September, October, it's yeah. a great time to go. All right, Clint, got to leave it there. Always great to, to conversation. Good Clint to Henderson, managing editor over at The Point Sky. A look at travel here on the big program. When we come back, a look back at Netscape's groundbreaking IPO and the big bang that formed the internet bubble. This is Bloomberg. All right, let's take a look back at history. On this day, all the way back in 1995, Netscape Communications sold shares to the public in what was, if not the first major IPO of an internet company, was by far the most influential, ushering in Wall Street's infamous dot-com boom and bust. Remember, at the time, internet browsing, it was still a burgeoning technology that was growing fast but had no real roadmap for profitability. Netscape, though, had a plan give away for free its browser, but sell its server software and the service contracts that go along with installing it. It was audacious. Netscape, Netscape had only existed as a corporation for only 16 months, generating less than $20 million in revenue over that stretch and no profits at all. But that didn't matter. They had a great narrative about long-term growth combined with the Midwestern charm of a 20-something Mark Andreessen, and that was enough for investors. The day after the IPO, the first Netscape trade posted at 71 bucks a share, almost triple the $28 offer price, and it closed out the day up 100%, making it the fourth biggest first day move for a U.S. IPO at the time. It was the shot heard round Sand Hill Road all the way over to lower Manhattan. The frenzy that that IPO created on Wall Street and Main Street to boot was best reflected in the recorded message individual investors got when they dialed into Charles Schwab that said, welcome to Charles Schwab. If you're interested in the Netscape IPO, press one. Netscape commanded more than 80% of the browser market at the time of its August IPO. But by December 6, the shares hit a record 87 bucks a share. But we know how this story ends. A day later on December 7th, in a now famous address, Bill Gates declared that the internet was Microsoft's highest priority. It plunged headlong into developing online services, websites, and of course, a competing web browser called Explorer. Netscape, it was caught by surprise, flat-footed. And by late 1998, its market share had eroded and its stock price had plunged more than 75%. By 99, Netscape had been sold to America Online for roughly $9 billion. And by 2003, AOL, which had now bought and rebranded itself as Time Warner, disbanded Netscape altogether. We should point out, Netscape did live on through a few iterations uh, over the next few years, but eventually, its demise came completely by late 2008. All right, we do want to get back to some of the results that we got a little bit earlier out of the big entertainment tear company, and that is Paramount. Of course, the earnings themselves, almost secondary. Everyone focused right now on that massive write-down, almost $6 billion charge here to write down the value of some of those linear TV assets, a bit of an echo of what we heard from Warner Brothers just about 24 hours ago. Jamie Lumley joining us right now, senior analyst over at Third Bridge to talk a little bit more about this. And let's start off with the write-off here, a $6 billion charge. I, I don't know if you call that a surprise, given that we heard from Warner Brothers there, but it really does get to this idea that that at least the linear side of this business just seems to be struggling. I mean, if you look around the industry, everyone's facing this issue. And while $6 billion is definitely smaller than the $9 billion we saw yesterday, it's still a massive number. But what's really interesting is if we just think about where this industry has been, there's been advertising pressure for years. There's been the cord cutting for years. These major segments of this business have been under so much pressure. It's not too surprising that right now there's a bit of a reassessment of really what the path forward looks like for this. What's really interesting is certainly last quarter, Paramount delivered some fairly strong results in its linear business. And that really just showcases 
how sports are really still at the center of this. They had the Super Bowl at the mm -hmm. start of the year. Yeah. And without it this summer, it's very clear that they're really hurting. But it's funny you say that because there's been a lot of talk about what uh, Ellison's going to do when, when this uh, acquisition is completed uh, and they take over Paramount. Because there was kind of this feed through, right? That what you got from the linear side of the business fed through into streaming. So whether it was a sports or, or even just the scripted programming, can those be separated? Can that still be viable if they're not part of the same company? You know, it's a really good question. This is one issue that also Warner Brothers Discovery is dealing with, is mm -hmm. how can you possibly piece out these different parts of the business as the content fed from the traditional pay TV linear ecosystem is what really drives streaming. But one other thing I do want to make sure we focus on as well is the direct consumer numbers for Paramount are really interesting yeah. this quarter. They delivered a $450 million year over year improvement to those operating income numbers. Because mm -hmm. what's really important right now is it's crunch time in streaming profitability. Yeah. And they're starting to actually make a little bit of headway here which I think is something worth noting, even with the broader write-down. That was the only segment that saw any real growth, 13% uh, of revenue growth for that direct-to-consumer uh, business. What was behind that? What drove that? Well, if we think about that growth, it's also worth keeping in mind that it actually lost quarter over quarter subscribers down almost 3 million due mm. to an exit from Korea. But also the other piece here is there have been price hikes over the last year. Uh, this has been one of the big drivers for the industry mm. uh, as not just Paramount, but Disney and Netflix yeah. and everyone has really been ratcheting up the ARPUs that they can see. Mm. So although they have been facing some challenges on the subscriber side, yeah. here with overall year over year improvements in pricing, that's what's driving Do you that think number. they're gonna continue to have that pricing power? We saw Disney raise its prices uh, a, a couple days ago here. Is Paramount in that same league? Can they continue to raise prices? Well, what we've really been seeing around pricing is yeah. that consumers are sometimes willing to accept that, but usually there has to be some new content offering, something big for Paramount. If they had another Top Gun style movie, mm -hmm. maybe that release would allow them to have these sorts of yeah. price hikes. But without that, it's a little bit hard to say that there's added value proposition, yeah. added value for consumers without some major new content that they're uh, I'm sure Tom Cruise would come back from that. That guy never <laughs> stops working, by the way. Um, talk, talk to us about what sort of a post uh, or sorry, I guess what of Ellison led Paramount might actually look like. I know he's articulated somewhat, but there's still a lot of details we don't know. There definitely remains a lot to be seen mm -hmm. here, but I think the first real area to look at is on the cost structure. Mm -hmm. One thing which we've heard repeatedly is that Ellison is looking at really bringing technology to the forefront for this business. One of the things for a lot of the legacy media companies is they not haven't necessarily been at the forefront of technology. So looking at the ways that that can impact the creative process, production, production costs have been quite high across the industry. So that's really one area to look at. Then also just the broader synergies of having Skydance Studio in its own right, very formidable with Paramount. See what that sort of content creative engine can really do. One interesting thing to see for the business. I do have to ask you about a two, two points that were in this release. One was the drop that we saw in theatrical release revenue. And there was also a drop as well in the filmed entertainment division as well. Was that just because the box office take wasn't as high as it could have been? Or was there something else going on there? Well, I mean, the thing which all these companies talk about is when they see a little bit of weakness year over year for the studio segment is just basically the timing of releases, what of it is captured in the quarter. There were a couple of strong performances this summer for Paramount. They had a Quiet Place Day One did quite well. If had a very strong opening weekend, but didn't quite have the same tail as other movies. But comparing with the year ago period, it had some challenges. Yeah. It's also worth remembering that it's still a challenging box office environment. Yeah. This year has had some big successes. Inside Out 2 over at Disney yeah. did uh, very strong. Well, I, was look, I was looking at kind of the list of the biggest movies of the year, and you didn't see Paramount same on there. It was basically Warner Brothers, Universal, and I forgot one other one was on there. But, I mean, they seem to be dominating, at least for right now, the box office for the year. Does Paramount have anything in the pipeline? Well, if you look at the pipeline, there's yeah. nothing which really stands out. Yeah. They're definitely hoping there might be some sleeper hits in there, but yeah. it's a fickle business, and they're really hoping that maybe Tom Cruise will come back for something. <laughs> I'm sure he will, though I, I hear he's expensive. <laughs> uh, Jamie, always great conversation. Jamie Lumley, senior analyst over at Third Bridge. A closer look at Paramount amount those shares higher in after hours trade uh, as we close out the day here with the market that had a big big rebound from this big big sell-off that we had earlier in this week a 2.3 percent gain on the S&P almost 3 percent on the Nasdaq indices two and a half on the Russell and in fact if these numbers hold in tomorrow meaning if we don't get a meaningful change tomorrow we've actually erased pretty much our losses for the week here, kind of belying some of the softness that we had seen a little bit earlier here. Uh, big moves, of course, in the Treasury space as well as yields continue to drift back higher. Right now, the two-year yield back above 4%. Your 10-year yield, which did trade above 4%, did close out the day back around that 3, 9, and change level. One of the big movers to the downside today was McKesson. We talked about it a little bit earlier in the 
program. Let's take a look at some of the after hours movers as well. We talked about Paramount moving to the upside. Take two interactive also getting a little bit of a pop up about 5%. It's earnings just crossed the wire. Uh, while their net bookings in the most recent quarter were in line with estimates, the company gave guidance that was, I guess, kind of on the nose of what the street was looking for. Net bookings for the second, their fiscal second quarter, 1.42 billion to 1.47 billion, pretty much on the nose of what the street was looking for. Elf Beauty, though, moving in the opposite direction. Its forecast coming a little bit light despite the fact that it beat estimates for the most recent quarter. A lot more coverage coming up here on The Close. Stick with us. This is Bloomberg. All right, some breaking news here on Paramount. We were just talking about their earnings. Now we're learning further cost cuts, a reduction of its workforce of about 15 percent. That's the headline crossing the Bloomberg terminal. That comes on the heels of the news that we learned just a few minutes ago that it's also taking a six billion dollar charge for its cable networks. A little bit of an echo of what we heard out of Warner Brothers Discovery the other day, linear TV business still in disarray. We're going to get you some more details on that story and bring them to you as soon as we get them. But we want to turn to something, I guess, maybe a little bit lighter. We talk so much here about the big inflection points, the big trends out there, AI, GLP-1 drugs, and how about pickleball? Yeah, it's all the rage, at least if we walked around New York. And today is National Pickleball Day. I didn't even know we had that, but it's here. Pickleball is often considered to be a combination of badminton, tennis, and ping pong. More than 13 million people of all ages and athletic abilities partaking across the U.S. And I'm joined right now in studio by the co-founders of City Pickle, Mary Cannon and Erica Desai. Joining us here in studio, too. City Pickle is New York City's first indoor pickleball club. How many locations do you guys have? Um, we operate 30 lo uh, location, mm -hmm. 30 courts, um, over a handful of locations. And thank you very much for having us today. I, absolutely. I mean, look, this is all anybody talks about. I mean, it's so funny because like pickleball really came to my radar like I don't know a few years ago. I think I was like in Hilton Head or somewhere, and I saw everybody uh, pinging it. And then now it's just kind of exploded. It's everywhere. Uh, and I was I didn't even know the origins of this. I was having this conversation with my wife last night. I was just preparing for this. That basically just some couple dudes in Oregon or somewhere in the Pacific Northwest were just trying to entertain their kids and you know they, they had a badminton net but they didn't have the shuttlecock and somehow that morphed into the paddle and the hard ball and lowering the net uh, and, and it's gone from that and whatever that was in the 60s 70s to now it's this is like a business it's the yeah. fastest growing sport yeah. in the United States yeah absolutely do you think that growth is going to continue for Ab sure absolutely mm -hmm. I mean First of all, we've seen year over year growth that I think is up 223% over the last few years. Mm -hmm. And we haven't even s scratched the surface of things like youth pickleball, college level pickleball. Yeah. All of these things are coming and the sport we think is going to continue to grow. We'll, we'll expand on that because most of the people I see playing pickleball are just like me, you know, just kind of slobs, so, you know, who just, you know, uh, no, yeah, we're not really trying to like, you know, set the world on fire. We're just trying to have a little fun <laughs> with, our, with our buddies here. Absolutely. But are you getting kind of that kind of, I guess, for lack of a better word, more elite focus? folks playing this? For sure. Yeah. Um, well, first of all, also with pickleball, you don't age out. Um, wow. We really do. It, it is a sport for everyone ages 8 to 88. Mm -hmm. Although, guess what the average age of a pickleball player is in the United States? Uh, I would say in the 30s. You're exactly right. Well, you that. did your homework. Score 35. Yeah. Okay. Um, and, you know, there is professional pickleball. Mm -hmm. um, so there's the MLP and the PPA. Yeah. That's attracting great athletes. Um, and Americans are watching in the millions as well. Why do you think uh, this, uh, maybe, maybe get you up in here, Erica. Why do you think this caught on the way that it did? Well, during COVID, yeah. people started playing pickleball mm -hmm. because it was something that they could do really easily. I mean, the beauty of pickleball is that you can throw up a net in your driveway, in mm -hmm. your cul-de-sac, and you can be outside. At that time, you could be you know, socially distanced, and you could have a lot of fun with your friends and your neighbors and move your body and do all of the things. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, as we came out of COVID, I think you know, people wanted to come together in real time and space and form community and shared activities and pickleball really offers that because it's very accessible anybody can learn how to play pickleball you can be any age mm -hmm. you can be any any athletic ability yeah and it's something that you can learn really quickly uh, let's talk about locations and like where you want put locations i mean yeah. is there sort of a strategy there where you look for you know i guess where i don't know what are you looking for 
Sure. Well, yeah. we were very mindful when we, when Eric and I decided on our company's name, City Pickle. Mm -hmm. So we are laser focused on dense urban areas. Mm -hmm. uh, we operate um, 14 courts at Woman Rink in Central Park. Mm -hmm. um, we have locations also throughout New York City, mm -hmm. and we operate in Philadelphia as well. Mm -hmm. um, and so we are looking for barriers to entry because, as Erica mentioned, the beautiful thing about this sport is anybody can play mm -hmm. if you're in the suburbs. It gets a little <laughs> bit harder. Yeah. Um, when you're in, uh, you know, when you're in the concrete jungle. You, you mentioned the, the locations in uh, in Central Park uh, here for those folks that don't know where Woman Rink is. Uh, are most of your locations outdoors, or are they weather protected in, indoors? Or we have an indoor yeah. location in Long Island City yeah. where we also have a full bar and restaurant. Yeah. So we can really emphasize the social nature of. Because that's there. what I'm curious about is how you make this a year-round sport. Obviously, everybody, like I said, if you're vacationing at the beach or something, you'll play pickleball or you'll go to Central Park here in New York. But what am I going to do in December and January? Oh, join yeah. a league, yeah. take a clinic, join yeah. our open plays. Mm -hmm. um, it's very popular year round. What's the uh, growth strategy now? Like, what do you want City Pickle to become? We want to put a paddle in every urban dweller's hand. Uh -huh. um, and we're very fortunate to have partnered with Mark Lazary's mm -hmm. uh, Avenue Sports Fund. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, the, the, with their partnership, we are looking to expand into further cities. What's it like working with him? Because I remember he, he must have come on the program. This must have been over a year ago. He was talking about the professional, one of the professional uh, pickleball leagues. And he was all in on this. And, of course, he's been a big investor in a lot of sort of, I guess, alternative sports, if you will. Uh, was his enthusiasm, did you find him? He had a certain enthusiasm for this? Absolutely. Yeah. I think they're big believers in recreational pickleball as we are, mm -hmm. and they share our goal of yeah. really spreading that joy in community. Do you two have a background in sports at all? Um, we, we do. I yeah. was a college athlete. Okay. Um, but, but not in pickleball. Not in pickleball. <laughs> yeah. That is coming. Yeah, yeah. I rest okay. assured that yeah. is coming. Yeah. No, and um, you know, the thing about pickleball that's so great is that people who always identified as athletes are loving this sport and are taking it to new levels. But people who never identified as athletes before are loving it. It's getting them off couches and making them happy and healthy. Mm. And just uh, one final question here. When we talk about uh, the money coming into this, you mentioned Mark Lassery and his investments. There's a lot of other big investors that have taken an interest in this uh, as a sport. Do you think we're going to see some consolidation here? Because there are a lot of different leagues. There are a lot of different uh, city pickles out there, competitors of yours, if you will. Yeah, I think that's yeah. natural that there will be consolidation coming later. Yeah. Um, I do think it's also very interesting watching other companies um, lean into the sport in unexpected ways. For example, we are super honored yeah. that Mount Sinai has agreed to partner with us okay. to bring more pickleball in a very affordable and accessible way yeah. to New Yorkers to make New Yorkers healthier and happier. All right, and I lied. One final question. This is a loaded <laughs> question. My wife wanted me to ask it. Is there any way to make those balls a uh, little like softer, like so they're not as loud. <laughs> you know, there are people working on that, but right now we're, we're yeah. working with the wiffle balls. All right. We uh, like the way it sounds. Yeah. All right. Great stuff, guys. Uh, really fun. Uh, Mary Cannon and Erica Desai, they are the co-founders of City Pickle. All right, it's time now for our top three, where we name drop the people driving some of the day's most talked about stories. And we stay in the world of sports. We stay with the Olympics and we stay, of course, with one of the greatest Olympians ever. Simone Biles and her leotard sales have been rising. This following her fellow, her and her fellow U.S. gymnasts competing in Paris, winning gold. GK Elite is the maker of those outfits. And now apparently anyone who does gymnastics wants to get one of these uh, on their bodies here. We're seeing that sales uh, coming out of the Olympics is now top what they saw from the Tokyo Games in just a few days. The second person that we're keeping an eye on today is Kathy Wood. She's back in the news. That's because the head of ARK Investment Management, she looked at that massive sell-off and she bought the dip. Big dip buying in some of her funds here. This, of course, as her flagship fund, still remains mired in the doldrums, at least for 2024. But of course, Kathy Wood is nothing if not a long-term investor is looking at those moonshots and maybe picking up a few bargains along the way. The third person we're keeping an eye on is Steve Martin. The actor actually declining to play Tim Waltz on Saturday Night Live. This is according to a report by the L.A. Times. This after a lot of folks on the Internet decided that Tim Waltz, the vice presidential pick of Kamala Harris, who's running for president here in the U.S., everyone said Tim Waltz has an uncanny resemblance to Steve Martin. Look at that. Have you ever seen these two guys in the same room together? They said Steve Martin should play him on SNL, as, of course, he will be parodied now that he uh, is on a major ticket here. But Steve Martin said, nah, he's not interested. So I guess Saturday Night Live is going to have to find someone else to do the heavy lifting for them. 
All right, stick with us. We've got a lot more coming up here on the big program, including some of the big market moving events over the next 24 hours. This is The Close on Bloomberg. I just look forward to these debates. I think it's very important that we have them. I hope she agrees to them September 4th, September 10th, September 25th. And uh, I think they'll be very revealing. And that was former President Donald Trump, now the Republican nominee uh, to get back into the White House. He was speaking a little bit earlier about whether he would debate Vice President Kamala Harris, confirming that he will, though he did get the dates wrong. Uh, the Trump campaign did issue a correction. We now know that that ABC debate will take place on September 10th and the NBC debate will be on the 25th. Uh, interesting uh, press conference that uh, Trump held today. He also talked a little bit about policy and actually said that he thinks that the president of the United States should have some say over interest rates and monetary policy. That would, of course, would be a move that has some people raising their eyebrows. Gregory Cordy joining us right now from our Bloomberg Bureau in Washington. I do want to start off first, uh, uh, Gregory, with uh, the debate. There was a lot of discussion as to whether these two would debate. I know Trump had seemingly struck his own deal with Fox. Uh, Kamala seemed to have struck her own deal with ABC. Is this it? These two debates, ABC and NBC, are these the two ones we're going to get? Most likely, you know, we've abandoned the process that uh, we had in place for 40 years where debates were sponsored by the Commission on Presidential Debates. It was an independent, nonprofit, nonpartisan group that included both Democrats and Republicans. They set a schedule of three debates, at, usually at universities across the country. It was an educational experience. And for whatever reason, both sides, uh, Joe Biden and Donald Trump this year, decided to dispense with that. So now we're left to each can both of the campaigns sort of negotiating with individual networks whether they'll show up to a debate. Obviously, every network, once they have a debate, so yeah. they've extended the invitations. Trump seemed to go on the offense today, saying he was challenging uh, Harris to these debates. But in fact, Harris had already agreed to that ABC debate that you talked about. Yeah. And so this was Trump just really trying to up the ante here yeah. uh, and, and reclaim some of the spotlight. I, I am curious. I, I mean, I, why he decided to call this press conference, I guess, in this fashion at this particular time. And I'm also curious to get your thoughts uh, about what he's had to say about monetary policy and Jay Powell. Yeah, well, he's really sort of uh, ceded the limelight to Kamala Harris and her running mate, Tim Walls, over the past uh, 17, 18 days since Joe Biden stepped out of the race and uh, left uh, Kamala Harris as the, the now the nominee of the Democratic Party. So this was uh, really just a, an attempt to kind of get back into the the, the yeah. mix here. Uh, and uh, he was asked about uh, monetary policy, yeah. he was asked about uh, interest rates, and he said that the president, he thought, should have some say in setting monetary policy. This is yeah. sort of a, a longstanding thing yeah. with Trump. He, he, he thinks he's smart on these issues, that he thinks he's smarter than the Federal Reserve, in fact. Yeah. And uh, he said that he, he thinks the president has the power to fire the chairman of the Federal Reserve, yeah. and he thinks that he should have some say in interest he didn't say exactly what form that should take or or how exactly he yeah. should give that input. All right. Gregory, uh, we're gonna have to leave, Gregory, we're going to have to leave it there. We're running out of time here. That does it for us on the close. But stick around. This is Bloomberg.